Morning. Okay, we are still in our hope series over uh, Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. Um, there are two letters, and they're both awesome. I, I love these two books. I'm so excited about preaching. We're just scratching the surface of all the cool stuff we're going to find out in here. But uh, just to get you caught up, this Thessalonian church was a young church. I mean, relatively new, uh, and they were they had become a church after Paul's missionary journeys. But despite being a young church, they were, they were, I mean, very committed and faithful. I mean, beyond their years, committed and faithful. Uh, and that's despite all the persecution and false teaching they endured, which was a ton. They were still focused. Uh, but they remained uh, focused and committed, even, even though they were, I mean, under heavy, heavy burdens. And, and, and because of that, Paul was excited about investing in them. He just felt like they were a great spiritual investment. And by investing in them, I mean, he wanted to continue to encourage them, and he wanted to uh, continue to teach and direct them. Now, Paul only spent three weeks uh, in Thessalonica, and then he was ran out of town. And he was ran out of town by both Jews and pagans. And the reason that they ran him out of town was because the gospel he was preaching was changing lives. I mean, people were being converted. People who had been lifelong pagans and lifelong Jews were being converted. And they were afraid, both the pagans and the Jews, that if, they, if these people kept getting converted, they would lose their power and influence over these people, which was very important to them. So they ran him out of town. Now, when Paul left there, him and uh, his cohorts, if you will, or his, him and his company settled in Corinth for a while. Uh, and, but while they were in Corinth, Paul still had this really heavy heart because Paul was still worried because he knew they had endured persecution up to that point, but he also knew there was a lot more coming. And he was just worried what they would have to face being so young. So he sent uh, Timothy back to check on him to see if their faith was still strong. So today, Paul's going to kind of revisit some. We've discussed some of this, but he's going to kind of revisit uh, the events right before and after Timothy's visit with uh, the Thessalonians. And we're also going to uh, kind of discuss the importance of investing in the faith of others. So the title of today's message is An Investment in Faith. And we're caught up. Okay, let's jump into today's message. We're starting chapter 3, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. It says, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer... We thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, uh, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions, for you yourself know that we have been uh, destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that, there were, uh, that they were going to suffer affliction, and so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find, about, uh, find out about your faith for fear that the, temper might have temp the tempter might have tempted you uh, and our labor would be in vain. Who you're going to have to pray? I'm still looking through fog in my contacts. <laughs> it's like reading in a fog bank. All right. So anyway, uh, so Paul, again, Paul was worried uh, about these Thessalonians, and he was worried about how much they're being persecuted, and he was worried about them being able to continue to withstand that. And so much, he actually said it was kind of driving him crazy. He said, I just can't stand it anymore. Have you ever had something bug you so bad it literally feels like it's driving you crazy? Have you ever had that? If you're a Steelers fan, you've had that. But um, it was just driving him nuts. He had to do something, so he wanted to, to send Timothy, and he sent Timothy uh, to check on him and report back to him. Now, one of the things you see here is Paul has a great love and concern uh, for the people that he teaches and for the spiritual health of people, you know, as a whole. And that's what made him such a great leader. He was a great leader because he cared. But another thing good leaders are is they're usually very efficient. And Paul was no exception to that rule. Uh, and Paul knew by sending Timothy, it would accomplish two really important things. Okay. Uh, I mean, he said that he sent him to strengthen and encourage the Thessalonian faith. That's what he sent him for. Right. And some translations say that, you know, Establish instead of strengthen. I mean, it just depends on which translation you have. But the Greek word for both is sterizo. Uh, and its definition kind of explains what Paul sent Timothy to do. Uh, it means to cause someone to be stronger in the sense of more firm and unchanging in attitude or belief. And that's exactly what Timothy went to do. He went to make them stronger. He wanted to make them more firm in their attitude, more firm in their belief. And so that's what Paul sent him to do. Uh, and this is his way of, you know, making another investment in the faith of Thessalonica. But Paul knew that, invite, you know, investing in the faith of others always pays dividends, and he was, he was committed to it. See, a lot of times I think people only want to invest in things that are going to be, get, pay dividends to them personally. Paul's like, by doing this, by investing in them, it helps the church as a whole. It pays spiritual dividends across the board, and that's why he was so excited to do this. See, he had been persecuted. There is nobody that I'm aware of in Scripture that was persecuted as bad as Paul was. He went through more persecution than anybody in the New Testament. 
And so he also knew how discouraging it was to be faithful, yet to still be suffering. Because you're doing what God asked you to do, yet you're still suffering. And that can be discouraging. It still can be discouraging. It takes really strong faith to endure persecutions and still be strong, even though you feel like you're doing what's right. But that kind of strength only comes from from experiencing God's power in difficult situations. You know, trusting God when you're in difficult situations, even when you don't see the end, even when you don't know how it's going to work out, trusting God and seeing him work. And when you see God work enough in tough situations, you start to build a confidence in tough situations. Right? And this is what Paul was hoping that would happen uh, for these Thessalonians. Now, Paul didn't want the Thessalonians to get overwhelmed and give up because I know he had seen so many people and witnessed so many people give up right before God got to reveal his power. Can you imagine what would have happened if Moses would have chickened out at the Red Sea? If he got up to the end of the Red Sea and saw the water and just said, hey, well, that's the end. We had a good run. Let's go back to Egypt. Can you imagine if he'd just given up? But because he didn't, he got to see God work. Paul was used to seeing people give up before they got to have that Red Sea moment. He knew that those who give up too early, I mean, realistically, if you give up as soon as you get persecuted, you never really get to know God. You can't know God if you don't allow him to be God in every situation in your life, including struggling. Sometimes struggling will make you a better believer, will make you a better person, because you learn to trust in God and not to trust in yourself so much. Paul knew that. So he just wanted to remind him, listen, All faithful believers, we're destined to suffer persecution. But that doesn't have to be a bad thing. This is what he wanted them to know. And Jesus said something very similar in John 15. Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it what? It hated me before it hated you, which is never a truer statement. You still see that today. He says, it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the, world, uh, the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will what? They will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. So even Jesus said, listen, you're going to have persecutions. See, you can't be in a battle if there's no one on the other side of the battle lines. We are in a battle, and we are battling a formal, I mean, a very formidable op- opponent. Satan is good at his job. And he is going to attack us. There's nothing we can do to change that. And here's the thing. The enemy knows he can't take our salvation. He knows that. But he can discourage us. And he knows that when believers are discouraged, most of the time, they don't serve God like they should. A lot of times, they just give up. So as soon as you start stepping out for God, as soon as you start getting bold, expect an attack. It is going to come. He's going to pounce on you. I guarantee you that. I can't tell you how many times I've been discouraged or hurt in ministry time and time again. And if I would allow that to run me off, I would have been ran off like a thousand times since I've been saved. I'm telling you, since I've been saved, since I've been in ministry, I've been betrayed. I've been lied about. I've been lied to many, many times. I've been attacked. I've been taken advantage of more times than I care to think of. And that's just a few of the things I've experienced. But when that happens to me, believe me, I get discouraged just like anybody else. But when that happens to me, I try to remind myself of something. And that's something that I try to remind myself of is why I got into ministry in the first place. Why did I do it? I got into ministry because I wanted to serve God, and I wanted to see God change other people's lives the way he changed mine. That's why I got into ministry. Then I have to remind myself what I did not get into ministry for. I didn't get into ministry to be popular. I didn't get into ministry to be rich. Listen, if you're in seminary or if you're studying to be a pastor or it's your desire, if you're doing it to get rich, find another profession. Okay, not so much. I didn't do it to get rich. I didn't do it so I could be light or a social media phenom. I did it because I wanted to serve God and see people's lives change the way he's changed mine. Just always remember, if God is pleased with you, what does it really matter about what everybody else thinks or says? It just doesn't. And I have to remind myself of that all the time. And I know I shouldn't even say this, but how many times have you actually said to yourself in your head, this is kind of a crock. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I'm trying to serve. I'm volunteering. I'm reading. I'm trying to do everything they tell us to do. And yet here's this persecution. Has anybody ever been there where you thought that? You don't have to raise your hand, but I know. You've been there. And you're almost afraid to say it out loud like like God doesn't hear it if you don't say it out loud. (laughs) But everybody gets to that point. But the trick is reminding yourself, listen, Paul was a great man. I look up to him, but he was persecuted. Peter was a great man. He was persecuted, martyred, just like Paul. 
Every person who did something amazing for God was persecuted. But that made the things they do even more amazing because God blessed them and showed up big time for them. So it's, not, it's something Paul was aware of. Now let's move on in verse 6. It says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love that you, uh, uh, and that you always think kindly of us, uh, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted uh, about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? Uh, as, we, uh, as we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. So when Timothy returned, his report about the Thessalonians was really positive, which was, had to be a relief. It was really positive. They were still standing firm in their faith, just like we said earlier, despite all that persecution. And this information that came back to Paul and them was like a huge comfort to them. It just comforted them to know that that young church was standing that strong. As a matter of fact, Paul said it even helped them endure their own persecution. Because listen, sometimes when you've been saved a long time, Sometimes it's seeing the faith of younger believers that will inspire you. When you see that new believer who's coming out and standing strong and stepping up and trusting God, it actually is kind of like a booster shot to you. It makes you excited again and gets you ready to serve again. And this is what Paul was saying. He's saying it actually made it easier for us to deal with persecution because it made us realize that the things we're being persecuted for is developing great churches like you and is, is actually moving in this world. And it excited him, you know, uh, and he knew why they were suffering. He knew why all that was happening, because their message was a threat, right? And when he heard that they were doing well, it was worth it. So Paul's message of God's grace was changing lives wherever he shared it. So imagine the persecution that man was under, right? Uh, the enemy couldn't sit still and allow Paul to just share the gospel and change lives without, without a fight. And that's one reason Paul said he didn't know if he could thank God enough for the Thessalonians' faith, because you know, that gave him that boost. It was an encouragement for him. He's like, I can't thank God enough for you, not only for your service, but for what your service has done in inspiring me to serve. So that's why he was so thankful. And he said he couldn't wait to get the opportunity to see them again. Paul wanted to enjoy fellowship with them and to continue training them. Now, on a side note, as a pastor, I understand both the fear and the joy that Paul experienced with his church. Because there's nothing more gratifying or humbling to know God is using you. There's nothing more gratifying or humbling than that. It's inspiring to know that the word that you're sharing is actually changing lives. That inspires you. I love that feeling. But there's nothing as heartbreaking as seeing some of those same people give up. And I'm amazed at some of the methods the enemy uses to convince believers to give up, and we fall for it. I'm, I'm amazed. Right? Let me give you some examples here of some of the stuff that he does uh, just to try to get us off chart, and we still fall for it. He uses relationships. How many times have you seen someone that got into a relationship that pulled them away from God? All right, the enemy uses that all the time. Persecution. I've seen people give up because they're just sick of their family riding them. They're sick of everybody making fun of them. Uh, gossip. Everybody knows there's no gossip in churches, right? Yeah, it's like a beauty salon, no offense, stylist. But I'm just saying, <laughs> there's a little bit of gossip. Politics. I mean, do I need to even talk about that? You know I mean, politics has caused a lot of people to struggle. Uh, hurt feelings. Hurt feelings crack me up. And that sounds bad, I know. I'll probably get an email about that. But it's hard for me. I guess I'm just, I just, I just put my feelings on my sleeve. I'm not, I, you can read me pretty easy, you know. And it's hard for me when someone comes to me with something so pettish that it's ridiculous. And I'm trying to look at them, you know, with compassion and concern. But all I see is this little baby sitting in a diaper with a passy in their mouth. I mean, I've heard, I've heard people come and say, well, they put carpet in the church and no one asked me what color I wanted. Nobody ever includes me on anything. And I'm sitting over here going, trying my best not to look at them like you're an idiot. <laughs> that sounds terrible. But that's the enemy pulling you out of focus for the carpet. Think about that, for the carpet. I've seen people who got their feelings hurt by somebody at church. And so... They're going to teach that person. They're going to stop coming to church. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you taught them. Except you're the one that's going to struggle for it. I just, I don't understand that. The enemy's been using this stuff for years, and people just fall for it and don't even question the source. It's the same attack he's been doing for years. Listen, we need to remember 
that good spiritual leaders know that that persecution is going to be on you. They know that. And so they invest in the lives of others to keep them from giving up when that persecution comes. And that's the same thing we all need to be doing, right? Now, listen, it's not about, people don't understand, when you invest in the lives of other people spiritually, it's not a short-term investment. It's a long-term investment. A lot of people act like it's get them saved and send them packing. You know what I mean? And then you put a knot so you can tell everybody how many people came to the altar. I don't know if you've ever seen that. People actually keep track of that so they can brag about how many people came. Listen, here's what you can brag about. You can brag that Jesus loved us enough to die on that cross despite the fact that we didn't deserve it and gave us eternal life despite the fact that we didn't deserve it and that he will get us through all of our tough times despite the fact that we don't deserve it. And so we need to invest in others the way he invested in us. That's the way it needs to be. But so many times people just want to make that initial investment. Oh, they believe, good, let's move on to the next one. That's not what it's about. It's a long-term investment, and Paul knew that. So let's move on, verse 11. He says, Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. So once again in verse 11, we start to see that paternal love Paul has for the Thessalonians. I bring that up every week. But he really does love them like a father loves his son or his daughter. He really does. You can see it. I mean, we see, we know that because he keeps repeatedly saying, I can't wait to come and see you again. I can't wait to have the time to have fellowship with you again. And, and that desire to be with them should tell us something. He had a desire to be with other believers who were, who were faithful and serving. He had that desire. And that should tell us how important it is to have fellowship. And I think this is something that's fallen to the side. Now, those of you who don't know, fellowship is a Christianese word for hanging out with other people, right? That's what it means. It's very, very important to hang out with other believers. And we see that. Here's the Apostle Paul. If anyone says, I don't need you, it could have been him. I mean, he was one of the most important people to walk through the pages of history. But he still needed and desired that fellowship with other believers. He wanted to see them, and so that should tell us that fellowship is certainly important. Here's the thing we forget. Christianity is a team sport. It's a team sport. We need each other. We need each other. And a lot of times I think we feel like, we're this island. Hey, we're saved. It's just us and Jesus against the world. <laughs> this is a team sport. We're supposed to be working together and drawing from each other. I mean, godly fellowship is kind of what inspires people to keep serving. It's so important, and yet we, we blow that off. I mean, the New Testament church was built on love, truth, and godly fellowship. That's what it was built on. And I'm going to read in Acts chapter 2, and when you hear this, people say, well, that's pretty extreme when you hear what they were doing. But realize they knew the value of hanging out with godly influences and other people who love Jesus. They knew the value of that. Listen to this. Starting in verse 41, Acts chapter 2. It says, So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. That's a lot of people in one day. Verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking bread uh, and to prayer. So did you hear the things that they were continually devoting themselves to? Teaching was number one, right? They were, they were devoting themselves to that. Then to what? Fellowship. fellowship. That's how important that was. It was the second thing. They were devoting themselves to fellowship. And then it said breaking bread. So eating is real important too, right? It's real important. If, that was, if I wrote that, it'd be breaking Jim's pizza. Verse 43 it says, Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and all had things in common and had all things in common. Verse 45, here's where people say it gets a little off the rails, but I don't think so. It says, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them all as anyone might have need. So what I'm telling you to do is go home and sell everything. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not saying that. But you see, they were willing to pay that price. Verse 46, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread mentioned eating twice, just throwing that out there, and breaking bread uh, from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. That's the third time it mentions eating. Just throwing that out there. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Here's the thing. Back then, believers knew they needed each other. They knew that they were targets. They knew that the Jews didn't like them, the pagans didn't like them, the Romans didn't like them, and they knew that there were people all over the place who wanted to see them destroyed. So they drew strength from each other. They used every excuse they could to be together. 
with the word, with worship, with eating. They wanted to be together with other believers. They knew how important that was, and they stressed that. And that was how the New Testament church got its kickoff, and it got a strong kickoff because they based everything on the word and depending on each other. Listen, believers needed each other back then, and we still need each other today. But I don't know if you guys have noticed this. It's gotten kind of cold in that respect, hasn't it? People don't want to hang out with each other anymore. It's like, I'll see you in church. I'll wave at you in church. When I see you in public, I'll act like I don't see you. That's kind of where we're at right now. When the truth is, they should be closer to you than your other family. And listen, a believer has an eternal bond with you. That person should be important to you. Somehow that's just falling by the wayside, right? Now, uh, Paul continued. He wanted to teach him on love and fellowship in verses 12 and 13, but he adds something. See if you can pick this up. Uh, verse 12. It says, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. What does he mention here that he didn't mention before? The second coming of Jesus, which changes everything. See, in verse 12, Paul said uh, a believer's love for people should increase and abound. He said it should increase and abound, okay? The Greek word for, ab for abound is perisuo, and it means to grow in quantity and intensity, and that's really important, okay? He's saying he wanted to see new believers and all believers abound. This is really important, and let me, uh, to make you understand this, my wife and I in May will be married 30 years in May, 30 years. I couldn't believe we, she stuck with me that long, I'm going to be honest with you, right? But in, so I understand this concept because it's a lot like that, because Jenny and I, have learned to lean on each other. We've been through some very, very, very tough times. I mean, times that probably would have broke most marriages. But we leaned on God and we leaned on each other. And one thing we learned through all those temptations, all those difficult times, one thing we learned was that we could depend on God and we could depend on each other. And we knew that. And that's why I honestly say, and I hope you can say this about your spouse, she's my best friend. We have been through thick and thin and she has never abandoned me. She's always been there, and I try to be there for her. Because of that fellowship, because we learned to trust each other through those difficult times, I am confident she's always going to be there for me. So our love abounds, meaning it's, it's growing stronger and more intense or committed as the years move past. And it's kind of the same thing, because believers should also be there for each other through the good and bad times. And when you are there for each other and encourage each other, you grow that same loving bond that makes you abound, makes you stronger, and you learn that you can depend on other believers, and it makes you serve more faithfully. And it's that dependability that makes us grow stronger and more intense. Paul told the Galatians something really similar to this. Um, Galatians 6.10 is talking about how to treat them. He says, so, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are what? Of the, of the household of faith. Okay, that means other believers. He's saying be good to everybody. But make sure you're especially building those relationships with others in the household of faith. Now, he wasn't trying to demean, you know, the love we're supposed to have for unbelievers. That's not what he's saying. What he was saying was that, that building relationships with other believers is how we get inspired to love and serve unbelievers even better. Okay, so he's not saying ignore unbelievers. He's saying get that strong relationship and get inspired to serve. Right now... I love this. I love this in verse 13. Verse 13 is where he really starts to, over, to, to explain some things that I think get overlooked. Let's look at 13 again. He says, So that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before God and Father at the, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And notice he says, At the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. When is Jesus going to come back with all of his saints? When he comes to take the church, when he raptures the church. A lot of people say, oh, rapture isn't mentioned in the Bible. Yeah, it means to be caught up, and the Latin word for caught up is raptura, which is where the English translation for the word rapture came from. So technically, all you people that say that and feel like you got a great point, you don't, okay? Because when it says to be caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, which we will cover eventually, uh, when it says to be caught up in the Latin, that's raptura, which is where they got the word rapture from. So there. I'm so tired of hearing people say that. Rapture's not in the Bible. Yeah, neither is a Buick, and you own one. So anyway, don't, don't get me started. But that's when he's going to come back with all the saints. That's what it's talking about. Now, remember that the inherent theme of these letters is to prepare for Jesus' coming. That's the inherent theme for these letters. 
And that was what Paul was talking about in verse 13. He was talking about preparing for Jesus' return. So everything that he was telling these new believers about being strong and building fellowship and, and leaning on the word and depending on each other, these were things he was telling them to make them stronger so that when the Lord came back, they could be rewarded. That's what it was about. If you look in chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews says something really similar. It's really important. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. It says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now, that's so important. It says, let us consider this is how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. That's very, very important. So how do we do that? How do we encourage people to love and good deeds or stimulate people to love and good deeds? Verse 25, it says, not forsaking our own assembling together. Not forsaking our own assembling together. People always tell me, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And you are right. You do not. But you do have to go to church if you want to be a Christian that is blessed and growing, because it's something that assembling increases our strength. He says, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. How quickly does it become a habit when you start finding reasons to miss church? You ever notice that? I mean, like that, it becomes a habit. And it's like pulling nails getting you to go back to church after that. It's harder to get you to go back than it was to get you to leave. Right? But he's telling us how important that is. Right? As become the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see what? The day, the day drawing near. So the writer of Hebrews, which a lot of people debate about, I personally think it was Barnabas, but a lot of people debate about that. Um, but the, the writer of Hebrews was trying to tell people, listen, it's important that you assemble and draw strength and inspire each other to do good things because the day of the Lord is drawing near. We need to be focused and teaching people before that day happens because that's when we're out of here you know one thing i told somebody one time which i probably shouldn't have i have a problem with filters but um i was talking to somebody one time about you know believing and they, they've been blowing me off for years and so they started asking me about when the lord come back and i said listen you better you better appreciate and take advantage of the concern i have for you right now and he said why i said because when the lord takes me out of here my concern ends because I'm going to have perfect knowledge, perfect understanding. I'm going to have a new body, praise God, with a good back, I hope. But, and when that time comes, I'm not going to be worried about you anymore. Because I will see perfect justice when I'm with him. And that's, that's true. Right now is the time to be worried about that thing, those things. Uh, listen, and Paul knew that godly fellowship inspired love and faithfulness, and he knew it leads to reward. So the whole purpose here was he was trying to make these believers someone that could be rewarded when the Lord came back. Right when the Lord returns. And I, I'm not going to get into this right now because this is a message we're going to be covering in chapter 4. But I will tell you this much. There are rewards that are going to be handed out for believers. Now, we listen, eternal life is not a reward. You can't earn it. You don't get it because you are good. If you got to go to heaven because you are good, none of us would go because none of us are good. Right? It's not a reward. It's a gift. There's a difference. Can all of you say that your, all your kids always earn their Christmas presents? Anybody here say that? No. You give it to them despite the fact that a lot of times they're lazy as all get out, right? Because you love them, you give them something. It's a gift. Eternal life is a gift that you get when you believe freely. It's not a reward. But when Jesus comes back, he's going to be rewarding believers, and there's going to be times when he returns, that some believers don't get those rewards. And I'll explain that as we move on. I'm so tempted to start it now, but we'll, we'll get that as we move on later. But he's trying to get these people to where they can be rewarded. Now, I want to finish this message with a challenge for believers before I finish it. Because have you ever had that time when your fellowship with God starts to just slip away a little bit? Where you feel yourself being a little more distant from God? Have you ever felt that? Where... You just don't feel inspired to read anymore. And it's a fight to get around and go to church. And it's difficult to pray. And when you pray, it's more systematic than, than heartfelt. Have you ever felt yourself slide into that position? And you're starting to wonder, why don't I still have that fire I had when I first got saved? I hear people say that all the time. Why don't I still have that fire? Well, listen, when you start feeling yourself slowly fading, you need to stop for a second and you need to check yourself. Check to see if you've been forsaking the things that God says will keep you inspired. Because if you're losing inspiration, the things that God told you that would inspire you, you're probably not doing. 
So when you feel like you're getting farther and more distant from God, ask yourself, am I going to church? I mean, I think I just read a passage that said that that was important. Am I right? Right? And so ask yourself that. Ask yourself, who do I hang out with? A lot of times who you are, I can tell you who you are by who you hang out with a lot of times. And you know that. And p- parents always get mad when I say that. They go, oh, that's not true. But then they wouldn't let their kids hang out with somebody they thought would, you know, influence them the wrong way. I, who you hang out with has a lot to do with who you are and what you believe. If you're not hanging out with believers, you're probably not being encouraged to love and good deeds. If you're hanging out with the world, they're certainly not going to encourage you to love and good deeds. And I think that is a plague in Christianity today. I really, really do. I think we want to be Christians on Sunday and like the world Monday through Saturday. And it does not work that way. It's more important that you're godly out there than in here. It's more important. But I think the reason it's happening is we just don't fellowship anymore. We don't fellowship anymore. Church is optional, and it's like fourth on the list. You know, if it's too cold and rainy to be on the lake, too cold and rainy to be hunting, too cold and rainy to be doing the other things, golfing, then we go to church. You know what I mean? That's why I think the world's in the condition it's in today. So you need to check yourself and see if you're doing the things that he told you to do to be inspired. It's not just about assembling in church. When it says not forsake your assembling together, yes, that that includes church. But he's also saying don't forsake spending time with other believers and drawing inspiration. You know, one of the cool things is there's times that you'll go to church and you think you're exclusive to the suffering you're having. And when you start going and spending time with other believers, you find out that there's a lot of people going through the same thing you are. And together, you can encourage each other to keep standing strong. That's one of the bonuses of being in fellowship because you always find someone that can relate to you and will encourage you to move on. And I I think that's something we're missing. Now, being intentional about surrounding ourselves with other faithful believers is going to inspire a lot of things, but the biggest thing that it does is it keeps us sharp. How many people have heard this verse, Proverbs 27, 17? It says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. You know, there are times that when I come to church, someone will bring up something, a passage, and uh, something they thought about a passage. And they'll ask me about it, and it'll shock them. And what they don't realize is that, you know, I'm still looking for inspiration too. And they'll say, you know, have you ever thought about this? And I will go home so excited because I'll spend the next two or three days trying to see if what they're telling me or what they're asking me has merit and I start to study it and it inspires me to do more things. How many times have Ben and I had a discussion about something in scripture that he saw one way and I saw another and the text and emails start flying back and forth as we're spending two or three days trying to figure out who's right. It's always me, but we're, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Not really. I'm not kidding, but no. So we start firing emails back and forth. You know, there's, there's times that just the challenges you get from other people at church. You know, when I see certain people who are faithful to the Lord, who struggle with things that we can't even imagine, it inspires me. You know, I've seen people come to church, I'm not kidding you, with so many problems that most people would stay home, yet they, they fight to go out and be with the Lord and be, in, be with other people of the Lord. They know how important that is, and that inspires me. And when you see people like that, it just encourages you that if they can do it, I can do it. That's what he's trying to do here. He's trying to tell them how important it is. He's saying, I will invest in you. I'm willing to invest in you. I'm willing to risk my life to invest in you. But I want you to do the same with each other. I want you to desire to be with each other. I want you to inspire each other. That's how the New Testament church survived. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how our churches today are going to survive if we don't start doing it again. I don't know how we're going to survive. We have become a church full of islands on their own, and that can't work. You know, we have got to lean on each other and spend more time together. And I love this message because he's basically saying... The Lord is coming back, and when he does, there's rewards to be had. But you need someone to inspire you to be faithful enough to get those rewards. Are you allowing that to happen? That's basically what he was saying in this chapter. Now, we're going to pick up next week in chapter 4, which is a very prophetic chapter. And if there's a week not to miss, it's next week, because we're going to answer a lot of questions uh, and and probably make some people mad, but we're going to answer a lot of questions about the end of time and, and give you some directions about end time stuff, so make sure you don't miss next week. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I'm going to ask you would to please bow your heads. If this is your first time, we always like to give an invitation. Here's the thing. We know that the Word of God is powerful, and people always think that you have to be preaching the books that talk about belief to get someone to respond, and the truth is the Word of God's powerful. And it speaks to us no matter where you're at, no matter what section of the Bible you're in. 
So if there's someone here who's not sure where they stand and they, they'd like prayer, I'm, gonna, I'm not judging you and I'm not going to chase you down. I just want to pray for you. Just make eye contact and put your head right back down and I'm going to pray for you. Bless those people. And I really do. And I'm not going to point you out. Bless those people. And if you're listening or watching online, God knows your heart and I'll be praying for you too. But believers, there's so much for us to glean from these letters. If there's ever been an example of spiritual success amidst hardships, it's Paul and Thessalonians. I just, I want us to have this kind of passion and desire again. I want us to quit judging people and start loving people again. You know, I'm tired of believers feeling like they're judge and jury rather than those who have the cure to a disease called sin. I want us to get back to that mindset of loving people and loving each other. I just pray that that happens. Let's, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for all that you do. We thank you for your mercy and your love and especially for your grace. God, we know that none of us deserve it. There are times we get full of ourselves and we get self-righteous, but the truth of the matter is we don't deserve heaven at our best moment because you see our hearts. You see the things that no one else does. So when you gave us the gift of eternal life simply by believing, there's nothing we could ever do to repay that. And if there's someone here who hasn't believed God or listening online or watching online, I just pray that whatever's holding them back, you remove it because your word says if they can believe what Jesus did was enough to guarantee their eternal life, they'll have it. And it's easy because the hard work was done by Jesus. And if they make that decision, I pray they contact us. But for those of us who are believers, Lord, let us remember what we've come from. Let us remember the amazing, life-changing events that happened when we believed. And let us have a passion to share those words with others and draw others to you also. Let our love for each other and for the world continue to increase as is our faithfulness and our passion for you. We just thank you, God, for all that you do. And we ask you to go with us as we leave here and keep us safe. And if you don't return before we meet again, let us come together and give you all the praise, honor, and glory at least one more time. We just thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.